the first thing I wanted to say is just to thank Pilar and Naomi for organising this event. Um, it, I think it's going to be the first of many, and uh, they've done a really great job. So thank you both, to both of you. So I think it's very exciting that in parallel with our developmental biology research in the HDBI, we're going to also examine um, various bio bioethical aspects of using human embryos and fetal tissue. And as I say, we, we hope that this will be the first in a series of seminars um, looking at various different issues. And please do make suggestions, um, you know, today or at any time really, send an email to Pilar or, or, or Naomi or myself um, so that we can plan future events as well and, and cover different areas. Now, we do realize that some people may find these topics that we're going to discuss contentious. And so because of this, I really would ask everyone to help make the seminar an open and inclusive and safe environment where everyone will feel welcome and able to participate, you know, verbally if they wish or, or just to listen. We're going to have two speakers. Um, and so we will, they will make their presentations to begin with and we'll keep our questions and discussions uh, until afterwards at the end. And we're going to finish promptly after an hour. Um, I think the best thing is if people uh, can post questions in the chat if they wish, but please wait until the end of the presentations before you do that. Um, Naomi and Pilar will, will then scan those and read some of those out. Um, we'll also keep an eye out for people who've got raised hands uh, who wish to say something as well. Okay, so we've got two great speakers today. Uh, the first is Insu Hyun. And we're really grateful to him for joining us. Uh, it's the morning where he is, not the afternoon. <laughs> um, Insu is, uh, has a, a very long and distinguished career in research ethics. He's director of research ethics and also a member of the faculty um, of uh, the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And he's also director at the Center for Life Sciences and, uh, um, and Public Learning at Boston Museum of Science. He's a Fulbright Scholar, Hastings Centre Fellow, and he has long-standing interests in various ethical and policy issues, particularly around stem cell research and around new biotechnologies. He's been very much involved with the International Society for Stem Cell Research, and he helped draft its international guidelines, and he served as chair of the Ethics and Public Policy Committee of that organization. He's also served on various national commissions, for example, the Institute for Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences in the USA. And last but not least, Insu is a member of the HDBI's Scientific Advisory Board. So we're really grateful to him for um, taking the time to help us mold our future as an organization. So Insu, over to you. If you'd like to um, share your screen, we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you for that introduction, Andrew. And thank you, Pilar and Naomi, for inviting me and for organizing this um, session today. All right, so I am going to um, start us off by thinking about moral status and the complexities of moral status. Now, um, I'm going to try to make this as, as um, user-friendly as possible. I'll, I'll only use philosophy when I absolutely need to. Um, and I hope that my discussion with you this morning is going to help your thinking about moral status and the use of embryos and fetal tissue for research. Um, so moral status is a very complex notion. I'm going to start off with the broadest, simplest definition of it. Moral status is basically when um, an entity has interests that matter morally to some degree for that entity's own sake, not for someone else's sake such that that entity can be wronged. And I'm gonna um, unpack a little bit of where I've highlighted and read those aspects of the definition. So what you first see is that actually moral status comes in degrees. Um, we talk about animals as having moral status, maybe based on their sentience, but maybe the life of a mouse is not equal to, let's say the, the life of a dog or the life of a chimpanzee or the life of a human being. Already there, we're talking about degrees of moral status where, um, uh, you can go all the way up to full, full moral status if you keep going uh, along that chain. Now, I'm going to, um, on the next slide, summarize what I'm talking about here. But just to continue on, um, why do we think moral status could come in degrees? Because they are maybe based on different grounds of moral status. What's required? I already hinted at one of them. One might be sentience. 
Um, now, what's interesting about this next point is, is it just that the entity has the potential for having these grounds for moral status, or, they, or do they actually have to have these grounds for moral status, whatever they may be, whatever constitutes the reasons for uh, giving something moral status? And finally, um, what about just being a member of a group that includes some members who are actually, they actually have moral grounds, right? So uh, people say things like, uh, human beings have special moral status because they're capable of great art. Well, I'm not capable of great art, but maybe I'm a member of a group, that group is human beings, for which some people are capable of great art. Um, so maybe just being a part of that group, even though I don't have those grounds, is enough. So that's just an example of, of that third um, category. So here's the summary, right? So moral status comes in degrees, all the way up to full moral status. That's the most you could possibly have. Most people put human beings up there, persons. And then we have all the way at the bottom, minimal moral status. And this is why animal research committees um, demand the review of uh, research with animals, because uh, even a mouse or um, zebrafish or amphibian may have some minimal amount of moral status grounded in their capacity to feel pain. Now, just the research uh, entity um, examples will suggest to you that there's going to be at some point a threshold for non-interference or maybe non-use in invasive research. Right? So it's not just because you have moral status that uh, you can or cannot use the, let's say in this case, animal for research. Uh, moral status doesn't give you that much, that much protection. You can have some moral status, but still be used for research. So you can still use mice that are fully sentient. You can still use, in some cases, uh, canines for invasive research. And, uh, and up until recently in the US, you could use chimpanzees for invasive research. So the question here is not whether or not something has minimal moral status. The more interesting question for me is, where is that threshold for non-interference? Now, um, to, to further summarize my previous slide, it's really fascinating that there are actually three different views of when something actually has moral status. One is that it actually has the grounds for moral status. So maybe a blastocyst might, you might say blastocyst has full moral status because it's the product of fertilization. So maybe being a unique genome and an organism built around a unique genome is, is sufficient, right? Necessary and sufficient for moral status. Um, others have said in the embryo debate, for example, that uh, it's just having the potential to become a full human being. Uh, that gives you moral status. So uh, um, a, a potentiality gets you there. And others might say, even if we're talking about an anencephalic newborns or those uh, individuals who don't actually have or don't even have the potential for the grounds for moral status, let's say uh, self-awareness and consciousness, that just there being a member of a group of a species for which some of those members have the grounds for moral status is sufficient. So whichever entry point you use, whichever uh, you know, of, of those three entry points for moral status you use, there's always gonna be that question of threshold. And as you know, for embryo research in the UK, uh, many have said that of, of course, the human blastocyst, the human pre-implantation embryo has the potential under the right circumstances to become a full human being. Um, and that gives it some degree of moral status, but not enough for it not to be used for research purposes, right? So I think the threshold question is really kind of the, the hidden key question that always lurks in the background. Now, um, I suggested that many people should, uh, get the entity up on the moral status ladder by some kind of single criteria, like there's gonna be some property that kind of gets it on that list, whether it's sentience, whether it's conception, insolment, et cetera. Um, so I'm going up the, the greater and greater complex, complex single criteria, um, viability, consciousness, self-consciousness. Um, I, I think that the, the issue here, let's say for, for embryo research is that some have said that primitive street formation is that key single criterion. I, it's interesting to me that, well, all mammals have primitive streaks, so it's nothing uniquely human. Um, all mammals are products of conception. Right, um, so so it has to be something like a single criterion that's uniquely human that other animals don't have, and this is kind of a favorite approach for moral metaphysicians and philosophy to kind of say, well, what separates us from all the other animals? What makes us unique? And of course, the single criteria that typically comes up is uh, rationality, or even a reflective self consciousness and autonomy. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, just getting back to the primitive streak issue, I, I don't know of any ethical theory in Western philosophy that says that the primitive streak is determinative of moral status. I've never heard a Kant scholar or Aristotelian scholar say, oh, it's when the primitive streak appears in the human embryo that you have full moral status. 
Um, and I think the real question here is why should any single, in this case, biological property be determinative? I think one of the concerns in philosophy, or at least the concerns I have, is a single criteria view is always going to leave somebody out. Right? You can always find a counterexample. Whatever single property you think is a touchstone for full moral status, you, you can think of a counterexample where some human being that we would want to protect lacks that property, whether it's reflective self-awareness, whether it's um, you know even in the case of, of, of uh, newborns um, consciousness, so uh, it's a little bit dangerous to look for that single touchstone. You're always going to find uh, counterexamples, and there's always the question lurking in people's minds of well, why exactly is that property so 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 important for moral status? I think a different way to go, and I think a way that many people in the research settings go is what's called a pluralistic properties view a full moral status. So your moral status is going to be based on a variety of distinct but intersecting factors. The way I like to explain this difference is sort of, you know, in, on the basis of classical set theory versus fuzzy sets. Uh, classical set would be like all those necessary and sufficient conditions that will make X what it is. Uh, but a fuzzy set will be, you know, that, that there are actually several different types of properties for which if you just have enough of them, if you have enough of a cluster of those properties, and they could be interchangeable, uh, then you get full moral status. So it might be a member of the human community. It might be, um, you know, capacity for empathy. You can sort of pick and choose among a very big menu of things that make human beings distinctively human. And when you get enough of those, then you get full moral status. So I kind of like the fuzzy set approach. Uh, that's definitely the way that we typically talk about biological categories and entities, even things like proteins, they, they kind of come in these fuzzy sets. Um, but in any case, if you take a pluralistic view, then that's definitely going to be consistent with the gradualist approach to moral status, right? And in the way that many people will say things like, as the uh, fetus continues to develop in the womb and gets to the point of viability, or, or as the child gets older and becomes a more self-aware and has, has actual autonomy, that their moral status grows as these capacities and as these kind of you know, elements in the fuzzy set get added. So again, the question here is at what point does something have enough moral status such that its instrumental use would be prohibited? I wanna make a distinction though between moral status and moral considerability. I think this is gonna be probably the most important distinction I'm gonna make for you today. And to draw this distinction, I have a picture of my dog here, Rufus. Uh, suppose that um, I'm traveling and I ask you, my neighbor, to watch my dog Rufus for me while I'm gone. Suppose, and I don't think anybody on the call thinks this, but suppose that you think Rufus has no moral status. So like, like uh, you don't think that my dog um, could be wronged. Uh, you don't think that um, it has interest for its own sake, not for other people's sake. You just think it's purely instrumental. But you're gonna take really good care of Rufus while I'm gone. Why? Because you might reason, well, I really care about Insu and I care about our relationship. I know that he cares a lot about this dog and that he's going to be very hurt if anything happens to Rufus. Uh, so I'm going to take really good care of it because not of, for, for Rufus's own sake. Remember back to my original uh, definition of very broad way. It's not for his own sake. And it's not because I think I can wrong him as the neighbor, but because um, he's important to my friend. Um, so he's morally considerable. I have to take care of him. Um, and there are many categories where uh, it's not the moral status that's in question, it's more like the moral considerability. So you might say, well, where else does moral consider considerability come with bioethics? Well, in stem cell research, human embryonic stem cells. You might say, well, I don't think that human embryonic stem cells could be wronged. Like if they die in culture, I don't have to apologize to them um, for wronging them. Of course, they could, they could die, they could be harmed but they can't be wrong. Like, there's nothing I'm doing for their own sake, but I have to use them very carefully in research. Why? Because of uh, you know, the, the, the social sensitivities around them, because of the, the donor interest in making sure that their research materials that have been donated are being put to very good use and justifiable scientific use. There are all these other practices that we have because these entities are morally considerable, but they're not in themselves the kind of thing that enters into that chain of moral status that they put up there earlier. Another example will be a whole organs for transplantation, right? If you drop a heart during the transfer from donor to recipient and it becomes damaged, that's a terrible thing that happened. You don't apologize to the heart. You don't say, oh my gosh, I wronged this heart. But certainly there were all these other human interests wrapped around this uh, scenario that, uh, that are of, of great importance. So 
Um, please keep in mind whether or not you're talking about the moral considerability of your research uh, entities, whether they're embryos or fetal tissue, and whether really you know, uh, you're, you're, you're mixing that up with a moral status and moral considerability. So I think moral considerability is really the more relevant category for everybody on this call rather than moral status. Um, I just want to just close by raising one final observation, and that is uh, getting back to the human embryo debate. Uh, I'm finding that the human embryo, the, the, the definition of that has been shifting. And more and more it's being defined by what it could become and less and less by how it was created. So uh, I, along with Negan Muncy, Martin Perra, Nikolai Reveron, and um, Janet Rosant, wrote this paper a couple of years ago where we uh, tried to give some guidelines for research on what are called human embryo models. So um, as many of you know, uh, this is an exploding area of research, but what we found was that there are countries for which the legal definition of a human embryo um, is leaning very heavily toward what these entities can do and what they can become if transferred into the uterus and less about how they were created. So just for example, really quickly, in the Australian definition, an embryo is a discrete entity that has arisen either from first mitotic division, when fertilization of the site by human sperm is complete, right? That's the traditional definition of how it was created. But look at the second one here. Any process that initiates organized development of a biological entity with a human nuclear genome or altered human nuclear genome that has, been, that has the potential to develop, so here we got the potentiality uh, criterion, to develop up to or beyond the stage at which the primitive streak appears and has not yet reached eight weeks, blah, 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 right? So what it could do, like a biological entity that has a human nuclear genome. Uh, in Japan, embryo is, uh, and just to skip ahead, it could be considered a cell group which has the potential to grow into an individual through the process of development in utero of a human or an animal. It remains at a stage prior to placental formation. In the U.S., the U.S. definition of a human embryo, just skip down to this latter part B, for the purposes of the section, the term human embryo or embryos includes any organism, dot, 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 that is derived by fertilization, look at this, parthenogenesis, cloning, or any other means from one or more human gametes or human diploid cells. Looking at these in these three countries where uh, embryo modeling research is, is active, uh, one might think that, uh, that we are heading towards some ambiguity and some trouble because, uh, for example, human blastoid models that are fully integrated and can re recapitulate not only the embryonic tissue lineages, but also the extra embryonic tissue lineages are not obviously the products of fertilization, but the question remains, what could they eventually become in the future with further technological work, right? So they had two methods, one from Jose Polo's team in Melbourne and one from Jun Wu's team in Texas in the United States. And in both cases, they uh, started with human pluripotent stem cells, whether they were uh, IPS or uh, ES cells, and they reprogrammed them, put them into uh, wells, and just in a very short period of time, recapitulated the human blastocyst, or what seems to be blastocyst-like in structure. And uh, it'd be really interesting to see in the future whether blastoids, whether human or mouse or other species, are in fact capable of giving rise to um, new life of that species. Now, again, these are not the products of fertilization. What's fascinating to me is that uh, you could have uh, um, cells either from an ES cell line or somatic cell and uh, end up with a blastoid. Um, so this is certainly an area that's moving ahead quickly and we need to keep an eye on that. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I just basically laid out several categories for you to think about and I'll be curious to know what you guys think in our chat. Thanks. Thank you very much, Insu. That was great. I'm sure you've, you've raised lots of issues which people will maybe thinking about and hopefully planning their questions and discussion points. Okay, so now we're going to move straight on to our second speaker. And then, as I said at the beginning, for those of you who join later, um, we're going to take questions and discussion after both um, presentations. So our second speaker is Bobby Farsides. So we're delighted that she's been able to join us. Um, some of us uh, 
saw her video when we did the public engagement training session a month or two ago so that was very enjoyable so bobby has um over 30 years of experience in the biomedical ethics field she is professor of clinical and biomedical ethics at brighton and sussex medical school where um, she's uh, been in that role since uh, 2006 and she's particularly interested in her research in the experiences of healthcare professionals particularly in areas where there are significant ethical issues so stem cell research um, uh, like in sue uh, but also assisted reproduction uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis organ transplantation and i'm sure uh, a number of others she is a um, past board member of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the HFEA, and she was deputy chair of that organization's statutory approvals committee. And she's also trustee of BPAS, the British Pregnancy Advisory Service, uh, and has been chair of BPAS's Research Ethics Committee. And I know um, of her role there from personal experience, having been up before her one, one or two occasions. <laughs> Uh, she advises on a large number of large, uh, sorry, on a number of large scale international studies um, on, on ethical issues. So uh, we're very pleased that she's able to give us our second presentation today. And over to you, Bobby. Thank you very much. And uh, my apologies for those of you who had two doses of Pharthedis in recent times. I hope I can add something to the fascinating discussion I had with Sarah on the training video. Um, I'm really grateful to INSU for setting us up so well today because uh, with beautiful clarity, he's nonetheless shone a light on the complexity of thinking about moral status when we talk about um, human embryos and fetuses. And I think that that complexity uh, is one of the reasons why it's very unlikely, even in a group as relatively small and cohesive as this one, we would, if we devoted the rest of the afternoon to discussing it, all come up with the same understanding of what we thought of the moral status of either a human embryo or a fetus. Or as Insu pointed out, an early embryo, a later embryo, an early fetus, a later fetus. And I would also ask you to keep in mind this question of considerability that he's, he's offered you as an alternative to that. But I don't want to treat it as an easy solution for the moment because I want to sit and rest with this idea of complexity and the possibility of not being able to resolve uh, moral disagreements. Because when that happens, our ordinary intuition sometimes is to park the issue, to avoid it, or maybe to even prohibit things that touch upon those difficult questions. But then something happens societally, historically, or maybe for some of us at an individual level, which means we have to move into action. We have to think about doing things which will in some way relate to the morally complex questions we've been troubled by and have yet to resolve. And if you look back to the late 1960s, when um, David Steele, then a young Liberal MP in the British Parliament, put forward a bill to uh, legalise or decriminalise, I should say, abortion in very specific situations, it was not driven in any way by claims on his part about the moral state of the fetus. It was a response to a public health emergency where women were suffering terrible morbidity and mortality uh, through backstreet abortions. And it was the uh, commitment to trying to save life that um, led us to step into the politically fraught and challenging area of abortion legislation and the shape of the legislation that arose was in many ways uh, a product of the acknowledgement that we were still dealing with something that many people found morally challenging some people would find morally abhorrent um, and therefore the controls and the limits and the way in which we kept this as a very carefully circumscribed medical 
uh, procedure spoke to what was happening morally at that time. Move forward to the 1980s when um, people were beginning to understand uh, much more scientifically about embryology. Um, we have the uh, development of assisted reproductive techniques uh, becoming successful and of course a growing demand for those techniques. And Mary Warnock was charged, some would say rather late in the day, with uh, finding a way of re regulating um, this area of science and medicine. Again, acknowledging, and, and who, who better to know than Mary Warnock, a, a, a moral philosopher, that we were not going to solve and degree um, on the issues of moral status. And Mary Warnock, very early on in her reckonings, said what we could agree on, perhaps, is the extent to which we all share an idea that human embryos, and, and I'll extend that to fetuses, are in some way special. They are different to other collections of cells, forms of life. And Insu has touched upon some of the ways in which philosophers might then choose to unpick that specialness. But again, Mary Warnock on this occasion was willing to park that and say, if we simply accept that how we treat these entities will matter in some way to most people, matter very much to some, matter less to others, matter particularly perhaps to those who get caught up um, in, a, in a personal way, be that as scientists or doctors, or be that as, as patients, um, we can start there with our regulatory framework and we can think about the things that matter to people and try and protect those things whilst at the same time promoting what we know is the promise and the use to which um, embryonic and fetal uh, material can be put. Now, as soon as you give up on that idea of parking or avoiding or working round a tricky ethical area, you will have people coming to warn you of the slippery slope that you are stepping onto. Because if you allow, don't allow so anything at all, um, things stay pretty stable, at least at an official level, although we know that unofficially, going back to the example of abortion, things do still carry on. But I'm going to suggest to you, and I'd be interested in Insu's response to this later, that slippery slopes are a more useful rhetorical tool than a philosophical tool. Because sometimes the things that people fear will happen logically, because you've allowed something to happen at a limited level, such as the very carefully re regulated use of early embryos, does not follow on. It does not necessarily logically lead us to a position where we would have to accept as morally acceptable widespread eugenics or, or some of the fears that, that people evoke. Furthermore, there's another sort of slippery slope, which we call an empirical slippery slope, which tries to suggest that the minute we move away from a prohibition and allow limited things to happen, it's necessarily the case that people will want to do more and more and more and it will become irresponsible and we can't stop it. We have shown, I think, um, in the UK that you can stay true to the fundamental principles and values behind a piece of regulation, such as the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, whilst not remaining stuck in time and thereby losing out on scientific and medical advantages that society could enjoy. And we've done this through careful, cautious revisiting of the Act, introduction of new uh, regulations and very much doing that in consultation with the public. Because I think this is where um, Insu's point about considerability is so important. Um, because if we wish 
to not just allow, but maybe encourage and support activities that touch upon ethically sensitive matters. We need to understand what matters to people and how we can reassure them, how we can build trust and how we can set a pace that means that this thing we sometimes call public morality and the law and the regulation and the activities of scientists stay somehow in step. And it used to be that um, philosophers would say, oh, well, what I'm interested in is, is only what people ought to do. But I think we've become much more uh, part of the real world in, in recent decades. And we know that in talking to people about what they ought to do, we also need to understand what they do and don't want to do, how uh, their values operate in relation to um, particularly important issues. And at a very basic level, how people behave when they are given permissions to do things that some others would prefer uh, remained prohibited. And that's where the work, the empirical work that I've done in um, stem cell laboratories, talking to assisted reproduction teams, etc., is so um, encouraging. And the fact that so many people have come this afternoon to listen not to the latest scientific breakthrough in the world that you work in, but listen to the knotty ethical issues that, that might arise as a result of that. Um, I think it is, uh, again, a rhetorical tool that is sometimes used that science has this um, momentum that means it attempts and often does race ahead of, of moral considerations. Um, my own experience is that the scientists I've worked with over the years are thirsty to reflect upon um, the ethical issues in their own work and that, that of those around them. Um, and their practices acknowledge not just the fact that a human embryo or a human fetus becomes a valuable resource to them in conducting their scientific research, but also that that entity had a different meaning and probably a different intention attached to it at some time in the past. And so you meet the embryologist who, before discarding any spare embryos, says a Buddhist prayer. Or you meet the team who discuss very carefully in the context of their um, early work on, on stem cell research, how comfortable they felt utilizing embryos that had been pronounced spare in the context of reproductive technology, as opposed to embryos that had been discarded as unsuitable for that. A, a fine distinction that many people from the outside might not um, expect to be being um, discussed and rehearsed. Um, people have pride in their science, but I think they also have pride in how they do their science. Um, and again, it unpacks in different ways. I met scientists who were far more exercised by the animal research they'd done earlier in their careers than the research that they were conducting with um, human embryos because they felt secure in the consent that had been given to donate those embryos um, and that the purposes to which they were, were putting them and the issue of sentience was nowhere in there in the way that it had been with their animal work. So I'm trying to cast a, a cheery note and some of you might think I'm being somewhat naive because we cannot pretend that the areas around um, the, the uh, issues of the moral status of fetuses and embryos is anything other than highly and some might say dangerously politicized at the moment and 20 years ago when I first started my research in this area people were sometimes worried to mention at a dinner party exactly what they did and the, the uh, human materials that enabled them to do their work. One can only imagine in the current context when you have um, people making wild and uh, dangerous and provocative claims 
about the, the use of um, human embryos and fetuses, how compromised and, and endangered some people might feel. But I'm going to make a plea to proceed with pride because as Andy says, um, in my role as the chair of the BPAS Ethics Committee, I received uh, four times a year reports from the project, the HDDI project, that's right, have I got the right initials? Yes, <laughs> the H and- um, HDBR. And HDBR, yes, sorry, I knew I'd get it the wrong way, HDBR. And at the end of that report would be a list of all the publications that had gone out in that time frame of important uh, scientific work, many of it relating directly to the interests of people who might initially have donated the uh, fetal material um, that, that had been used. Um, and whilst if you find yourself in an ethical minefield, it might sometimes be very tempting to try and acquire a cloak of invisibility. I think one of the things we should be thinking about doing is amplifying this sense that um, science can make use of and put value, additional value into um, uh, embryos which may have been discarded but may have also been donated or may have come to the end of a legally um, sanctioned time limit of storage. Fetuses that may have been through um, a, a tragic and spontaneous um, abortion miscarriage or may have followed on from a difficult choice for social reasons and Amazingly, I think Andy would agree from people who've had to face the terribly difficult decision of terminating a pregnancy due to fetal anomaly. These are all human stories that shouldn't be forgotten, but we should allow for the fact that those stories have gone on and translated into something socially and scientifically valuable. Um, and I've certainly in the past felt very um, pleased to have been a very small part of that process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobby. That was tremendous.